Good evening. For this program, we are going to concentrate on one of astronomy's greatest mysteries, dark matter. But first of all, our news notes. Well, first I think we'll go back first to the Turkish solar eclipse. Unfortunately, I wasn't there, but it must have been wonderful, and I'm most impressed by those photographs of Bailey's beads by Bruce Kengley and Pete Lawrence. That's right, they're wonderful images, and they capture the moment just before totality when the light floods through valleys on the edge of the moon. It's most spectacular. This time, we know just what the area is, but where it's possible. That's right, we're somewhere near the crater Einstein here, over on the limb. I discovered years ago, yes. Yes, yeah. well, it's providing a beautiful show, and right across through craters Bohr and Schuchter there, over on the left. But it's that image that will stick in my mind from the eclipse. It was wonderful. And look at this. This is NASA's view of the eclipse from a satellite looking down on the Earth. And you could see the shadow rushing towards us in Turkey. And it really was a memorable sight. And I've really enjoyed seeing all the images flooding in from all over the world. Well, let's turn now, shall we, to the solar system, beginning with Venus. And the new probe, Venus Express, is now safely in orbit and sending back data. That's right. It entered orbit a few weeks ago, and it's been moving gradually closer to the planet's surface to get into what we call a science orbit. So we expect the first real results in the next few months, but we've already got these beautiful pictures. And the thing to remember, that Venus Express is an atmospheric probe. It's there to study the atmosphere of Venus and resolve the many mysteries of what should look rather like the Earth, but doesn't. Let's go further up now. Jupiter at our position, and uh, very interesting, we know about the great red spot on Jupiter, and a smaller red spot developed. That's right, it appeared in 2000, yeah. but it was a small white yeah. oval back then. Uh, towards the end of last year, it turned brown, and then earlier this year, it went red. Now, it seems to be fading now, but at least that initial process may be giving us clues as to how the great red spot formed. Well, you might be able to observe this. Um, get the size of the great red spot, and about one hour later, the small red spot should come up. That's right, and goes across the centre of the disk. And Jupiter's obvious. The only problem is for us in the UK is that at this opposition, it's fairly low down in the sky. In Libra. That's right, but it's a beautiful object, shining and utterly unmissable in the sky, visible all night this month. Yes, indeed. Now, let's um, go further, shall we? I'm out of beyond the solar system, and this is your province, Chris. Yes, and there's one story I can't resist introducing. Astronomers using the newly upgraded Merlin network of radio telescopes... Central Dodwell Bank. That's right. ...have discovered a huge cloud of alcohol, 300,000 million miles across. It's a long way away. It is. It's around a nearby star-forming region. And it's interesting because it's telling us a lot about the properties of that star-forming region. In particular, this gas has been excited into what we call a maser. It's the radio equivalent yeah. of a laser. But it's spread over a huge distance, and no one quite knows how that's possible. One thing I should say, though, it's methanol, not ethanol. So even if we could... Yes. It, don't drink it. No, don't try and drink it. <laughs> Let's come back now to the solar system. And we have the disintegrating comets, Foxman and Foxman 3. This is a fabulous object, and the Hubble images show exactly what's going on. Comets are short-lived things. They only enter the inner solar system a few hundred times in their lives, and then they die. And this one is doing that right in front of our eyes. The comet simply come to the end of its life and is breaking up. Then, of course, um, we have the results from Deep Impact on Comet Temple. This was the probe that hit the comet back at, deliberately back in July last year. And though the mission is over, the results are still coming yeah, out. Indeed. And this month we heard about the X-ray results from a satellite called SWIFT looking at the impact. The impact, which was just of something basically cannonball-sized onto the surface, released something like a quarter of a million tonnes of water ice, uh, vaporised and thrown up. It's quite a staggering statistic. Then, of course, we have the Stardust probe that actually went to Comet Villa 2 and came back and got the capsule with samples. We've always assumed that all the material in comets comes from the outer solar system. That's yeah. where they formed it. It should be a cold, dark place. But the results don't yeah. seem to confirm that. And I went to the Natural History Museum to find out more. For samples of extraterrestrial material, astronomers are used to relying on potluck. Analysis of meteorites like this fabulous specimen here at the Natural History Museum can tell us a lot about their composition and also about the conditions in the solar system at the time of formation. However, nothing beats going out to get pristine material fresh from outer space. Stardust was launched back in 1999. It then encountered its target, Comet Vilt 2, in January 2004. As the probe passed close to the nucleus, travelling at more than 13,000 miles per hour, it collected dust particles and quite a few bumps and scratches along the way. The probe then returned to Earth earlier this year and dropped through the atmosphere on a parachute, landing safely. Once the mission team had carefully extracted the samples, they were sent all over the world for analysis. Matt Genge, working on his own share of the comet here in the Natural History Museum, 
told me about the team's first view of the solar system as it was four and a half billion years ago. When our sun was forming, we know that stars formed by the collapse of, 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 of large gas and dust clouds. And of course, because they all slightly rotate in space, as they collapse, they start to flatten off into a disk. And so surrounding the early sun was this, this spinning disk of dust and gas through which material was adding itself to the sun. But it's in this disk that the planets and also comets formed, and the comets forming further from the sun. So they're almost the leftover material. Absolutely, absolutely. And we've looked at this leftover material before, the meteorites that would come from asteroids, but we've never looked at materials that come from out beyond Jupiter that formed in the cold outer regions of this, of this, of this solar nebula, this, this disk of dust and gas. Now that's what we're hoping to have got from Stardust, and you've received your samples and they've been analysed here. Yep. We can go and look at these, at these particles, which are around 15 microns across, so 15th millionths of a metre, and we can look at the individual mineral grains and how they relate to each other, and as to a certain amount of their chemistries. You can see all the grey material is uh, calcium, aluminium, magnesium silicate, a very high temperature mineral. We think it formed at above around 1,900 degrees C. Well, that's really very hot indeed. It's, it's enormously hot. That's, that's one third of the temperature of the sun. And right in the middle you can see a tiny little bright grain which is a titanium oxide. This formed at ever so slightly higher temperatures than the surrounding silicates. Now, of course, comets, well, one thing we all know about comets is they contain lots of ice because they formed in the outer solar system where everything was very cold. So why do they contain these very high temperature minerals? Now, there's two different theories. One is that th these grains formed very close to the early sun and these high temperature minerals were picked up by a magnetic wind, the X-wind, and thrown out over the plane of the solar system. The second theory is that perhaps these grains weren't formed in the solar system at all. Maybe they predate our solar system and were formed around the atmospheres of, of giant stars. There may not be much material returned by stardust, but there are enough of the precious grains to keep scientists busy for years. There are lots of surprises still to come. And we certainly haven't heard the last of the results from Stardust. And now, on to our main theme, dark matter. And I have with me two very eminent professors, Jerry Gilmore from Cambridge, Bob Nicholl from Portsmouth. Welcome to the sky at night. First of all, may I come to you, Jerry? If we can't see dark matter, how do we know it's there? Uh, the interesting thing about dark matter is that it's matter. It's got weight, and we weigh it, and that's how we know anything is there, really. We can see some things, but most things we did, did deduce are there from their weight. You talk about weighing things, but um, that's not easy. How do you go about it? This is the basic way we weigh things, by measuring how quickly they move. Now, the simplest way to measure how quickly something moves is how fast it goes around something else. So we, we weigh the sun, the Kepler weighed the sun, by looking at how fast the planets go around it. And as you go away from the sun, the planets move slower and slower and slower, as they should. It's the famous Keplerian 1 over R law. Uh, and so when you look in the outer parts of the solar system, you see the planets moving slowly, and that means we know that all the mass is in the middle in the sun. I can do the same thing with a galaxy, and I can just measure how fast it's spinning. The interesting thing there is I get quite a different answer. So instead of seeing the rate of spin die away gently as I go away from the centre, what I actually see is the rate of spin staying constant. Now, what that means is that all the all the weight is not in the centre. So if I, in the solar system, the rotation dies away and the weight's in the middle. In a galaxy, the rotation stays high and that means all the weight's in the outer parts. And that weight isn't where the light is, the light's in the middle. The weight is in the outer parts and the weight's the dark stuff. And in fact, dark matter far outweighs all the visible matter we can see. That's right, yes. And even in a, in a galaxy like the Milky Way, there's probably 10 or 20 times more of the dark stuff than there is of the other stuff. Dark stuff is reality, we're just fluff. We know dark matter there because it affects on things we can see. That's right, and a, a good example of that would be clusters of galaxies. These are extremely massive lumps of dark matter. And uh, as Jerry pointed out, the first evidence that there was a lot of dark matter in clusters came from just looking at the velocities of galaxies. 
But since that, we've now got X-ray observations of clusters, which tell us there's a lot of dark matter there. And in the last few years, there's a new technique called gravitational lensing that people have used to measure the amount of dark matter in clusters. And there's now, in, for example, in a cluster, there's about 100 times more dark matter there than there is normal matter. How do you distinguish the two? You count. Uh, yeah, we just count it up. You know how, much, how many stars are there, you know how much gas is there, you count it all up and you come up with only about a few percent of what you need. So you're sort of left with this big black thing that, uh, that you don't know what it is and you infer that it's uh, dark matter. you got some new results, haven't you? Yeah. Yes, indeed, Patrick. We're uh, trying to discover how much dark matter there is and how it's distributed. Now, the, the stuff is often called cold dark matter. Let me just briefly explain. Cold doesn't really mean cold in the sense of temperature in a room or something. Cold means slow moving. And so the basic expectation uh, about dark matter is it's made of slow moving particles of some sort that should therefore pile up in small lumps, probably even smaller than the size of the Earth. And so we went looking for it. We moved on from there and said, well, what is the smallest galaxy that one could find that has uh, dark matter in it? And in particular, what is the smallest galaxy? And we've now got galaxies that actually have no more stars in them than quite a small star cluster. In that case, how do you distinguish between a galaxy and a star cluster? Now, that is a very smart question, and it's interesting. The real distinction, actually, is not how many stars there are in, in a thing, which was the old sort of definition of a galaxy, or what its shape was, elliptical or spiral or something. The real definition is whether or not gravity is controlled by dark matter or by stars. And if gravity is controlled by stars, it's a star cluster. If gravity is controlled by dark matter, it's a galaxy. And that's the fundamental distinction. Do you see galaxies that don't contain very few stars, then? We do indeed, actually. The, the smallest galaxy known, uh, apart from one that we're going to announce next week, has only about 10,000 stars in it. It's a very, very small thing. Where is it? It's a satellite of our own Milky Way. How and, far and, away, then? Uh, it's about 100,000 light years away. Yes, it's yeah. in the Ursa Major constellation. Yeah. There's a new one very near it as well, actually, that we've just discovered. Uh, so this thing is really a little ball of dark matter with a tiny few stars floating around in it. And it's perfect because it allows us to test how much dark matter there really is and how the dark matter is distributed. Basically because there's so few stars in there, what we're seeing is pure dark matter. So we're not having to worry about taking the difference between two large numbers. We can just use a few stars as test particles to, to tell us what dark matter is really like. So what do these results tell us about dark matter? The stars are moving quite fast. And that's the key to what's going on. They're moving at about 10 times or f sometimes even 20 times faster than they should if there were no dark matter there. And there's enough of these stars, we can actually work out from the way the stars are moving how they get the dark matter is distributed in 3D. Now, naively, what you might have expected was that most of the mass is in the middle and then it sort of falls off yes. the way it is in a normal galaxy, you know, they're brightest it's, in the it's middle. Not, in fact. But it's not like that. The dark matter isn't like that at all. It forms a very shallow distribution. And so it's almost constant in the middle. And it's actually very sparse, and we see that everywhere. And that is the first clue that's telling us something fundamental about what the dark matter is. It isn't the simple, lumpy sort of stuff that we might have thought, or we did think <laughs> until a few weeks ago. Uh, it is some more gentle, more diffuse, faster-moving stuff. So come back then to galaxies. And a few nights ago, Chris and a few other astronomers were at my observatory trying to see galaxies. Look up into the night sky on a spring evening and you're looking away from the disk of the Milky Way and into the realm of the galaxies. They come in all shapes and sizes, from tiny dwarf irregulars to massive ellipticals, much larger and more luminous than the Milky Way. To see the fine detail of these systems, though, you need to take images. And Nick Shamonic is responsible for some of the finest anywhere. Well, Nick, it's galaxy season. What are you hunting this evening? We've got lots of targets tonight. We're looking at galaxies in Ursa Major, two of the most classic galaxies in the sky, M81 and M82, and hopefully we'll take some images of M51, the lovely Whirlpool galaxy, not too far away from those others. Well, let's start with the, the twins, M81 and M82. So let's take them one at a time. M82 first. M82, the cigar galaxy. It's a lovely high-surface brightness galaxy, quite a small galaxy, but it has lots of nice... Um, core detail, we can see dark dividing dust lanes and make it a very interesting target for imaging equipment. And it's what professional astronomers call a starburst. It's forming stars at several hundred times the Milky Way rate. Certainly, yeah. M82 tends to image with a, a kind of blue cast, a greeny blue cast, so that's an indication they're fairly young 
massive um, stars in the outer part of the galaxy. Well, what about its neighbour, M81? I said they were twins, but they're not identical twins. Not at all, no. It's, M81 is more of a classic spiral galaxy. We see it um, slightly tilted from, from face on, but um, it's a very rich galaxy. It shows um, nice dust lanes, um, maybe material in the outer spiral arms, a completely different kind of galaxy to its near neighbour, M82. And of course, M51, the Whirlpool, is a spectacular galaxy. It is one of the loveliest galaxies in the night sky, very well placed tonight, high overhead, and we can see this lovely structural detail within the spiral arms. It really does look like a Whirlpool in the sky. The, the other smaller galaxy, NGC 5195, is a nice target in its own right, particularly for long focal length telescopes. And we can see an interaction, a gravitational or tidal interaction between these two galaxies in that we can see uh, an arm of star forming material being drawn out from M51. We talk mostly about spiral galaxies, but we shouldn't forget the ellipticals as well. They do tend to be overlooked by amateurs, so they tend to be fairly boring to look at, but a classic example is maybe the sort of granddaddy of uh, elliptical galaxies, M87 in the Virgo cluster. And uh, again, using the Fawkes telescope and with selective image processing, we can actually show the relativistic jet emerging from the core, emanating at close to the speed of light. And a sign that there's a very large and very hungry black hole at the centre. A black hole in the, in the centre. This is one of the most massive galaxies known. It's the centre of the Virgo cluster. Well, all we have to do now is hope it clears. Well, I hope so. The, the forecast is quite good for tonight, even though it's looking fairly cloudy at the moment. If the sky clears, we've got lots of telescopes here. We plan to image these, these lovely galaxies high overhead in Ursa Major, and hopefully we we'll get some good results. Well, it's nearly midnight, and the cloud is very much still with us. If it were clear, though, I'd be able to look up at the bowl of the plough and find the twin galaxies, M81 and M82, that we talked about earlier. They're visible in binoculars as two faint fuzzy patches hanging in the same field of view. The real spectacular images, though, are simply stunning. And amateur telescopes can produce images that the professionals would have been proud of less than a decade ago. So, while we're here, despite the cloud, let's go and look at some of the best images from the observers behind me. Well, Will, you've got a fabulous but quite simple setup. What was the plan? Well, the plan was to do a sort of uh, wide field sort of look at the sky. So I might look at uh, some of the galaxies that may be in Ursa Major uh, through the eyepiece and then take a picture of that sort of region with the digital SLR, which I have mounted piggybacked uh, on top of the little scope. Which is your favourite galaxy? I think it has to be the Andromeda Galaxy M31. That was the first galaxy I ever saw. Um, I saw it with the naked eye first because it's a very bright object. And then I used a half metre reflector a long time ago and that just blew my mind. One of my favourite <laughs> galaxies is M63. It, it's known as the Sunflower Galaxy. It's a wonderful wide open spiral galaxy and it looks like a sunflower. Do you really see it as a sunflower? I've never been able to see it myself. Well, it's kind of reminiscent of a sunflower, particularly when you image it with a CCD camera and you capture all those faint outer spiral arms. And again, it's got lots of wonderful detail in the spiral arms, H2 regions which are nice to capture, um, very well placed again in the spring sky. So, Pete, you're using Patrick's old telescope, but it's still a fabulous instrument for galaxies. But why this time of year? Well, this time of year is particularly good for galaxies. There are two times of year which are good for galaxies. There's the spring and the autumn. Um, and the reason why these are, are good times to see galaxies is that our galaxy, which appears as the Milky Way, of course, in the sky, um, has shifted round, and we're now looking at right angles out from the plane of our galaxy. So we're looking into to deep space, if you like. We can see these faint galaxies there. And on a spring night such as this, it's beginning to clear. We might have a chance of seeing the Virgo supercluster that's as a, well. Yes, that's a wonderful area of the sky. It's between the very tip of the tail of Leo and the left-hand star that marks the edge of the bowl of Virgo. If you train a small to medium-sized telescope on there, you'll see lots of fuzzy blobs, and there are a very large collection of Messiers there, including M87, of course, which is the giant elliptical galaxy. That's rising right now, but let's go back to what's overhead, and I can see the plough. How do I get from seeing the plough to seeing galaxies? OK, well, if, if we use the uh, modern asterism, if you like, of the saucepan, if we go from the, uh, the end star of the handle and you go at right angles to the end star, we come to a very famous Messier, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. If we use the two stars which mark the end of the saucepan again and go in the opposite direction to form an equilateral triangle, we come to M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy. And then if you take a line up through that galaxy, you also come to M102, which is the Spindle Galaxy, which is, in contrast, an edge-on galaxy and looks much thinner. 
Now let's move away from the north, and the first galaxies I can remember seeing are in Leo, M65 and 66. Yes, you can find those um, by wandering down the back leg of the lion, as it were. And it's actually called the Leo triplet. There's another NGC galaxy mm -hmm. in there. Um, which, and, and there's a, a wonderful contrast of shapes as well. Of course, you do need dark skies. Are we picked tonight, although there's cloud because of the moon's out the way, and that's very important. Yeah, the, the moon is a, a great um, filter for galaxies. It will just knock them out completely. They're so faint, um, a lot of the outer regions of galaxies, that as soon as you do get something which does cut back the light, um, you just see the inner core, and it's very difficult to make them out from regular stars. Well, it's two o'clock, and the clouds have actually cleared, and you've started imaging. We're, um, we're actually taking pictures, deep CCD images, of the Galaxy M51 and its satellite galaxy. At the moment the clouds are a little bit sporadic, they're coming and going, so we're just taking short, um, what we call sub-exposures mm -hmm. of one minute, um, and that way we can take multiple exposures and code them together to improve the, uh, the overall signal-to-noise ratio, the strength of the image. Here we go, let's see what happens. Wow, look at that! We can see these very clearly, we can see the outer spiral arms of M51 and the dot, and the dividing um, sort of bridge of stars between mm. the two galaxies. And there's even something going on around the satellite galaxy. We, we can see that much more clearly now, we've got a stronger image, mm -hmm. and we can see these horns of stars, if you like, actually emanating from the satellite galaxy, and also a faint background galaxy oh, yes. as well. I'm taking five minute, what are called five minute sub-exposures, okay. and I'll probably take anywhere from 60 to 120 minutes worth of those. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at an image at the moment which is three of those five minute exposures which we've co-added and it's already bringing out the spiral arms, um, the star forming regions and um, I've got a lot of hope for this image, I think it will be a very good quality image. You know it's really difficult to believe those images are from tonight, they're so good already and we've only had clear skies for the last half an hour or so. Mm. Once we get these back home again and uh, get a little bit more time on them, process them up properly um, hopefully you should get a uh, pleasing result at the end of it. Well, you do the work and I'll look forward to seeing it. Okay. It's turned into a fabulous night for observing and the results from the images are truly spectacular. Don't be put off by the technology though. Look up, enjoy the view and remember that the light that you're seeing has travelled across the universe for literally millions of years. It's a awe-inspiring thought. Well, uh, viewing galaxies, I'm um Nice clear skies, and in Celsius we do then we have clear skies. <laughs> now let's come back, um, Bob. There are two kinds of galaxies, the spirals and the ellipticals. What's the difference? When you look at an elliptical galaxy, which looks sort of like a rugby ball shape, uh, it's full of very red, quite old stars, um, almost certainly been around for many giga years. They live in dense regions. They like to live with themselves. They like to hang out in groups and clusters. And so when you look up in the sky, most of the ellipticals live in groupings together. So we get big clusters of red ellipticals. On the opposite side, when you look at these spiral galaxies, they tend to want to live on their own. They sort of hang out in uh, smaller groups, but also they sort of hang out uh, to themselves. And when you look at uh, the spirals, and certainly the spiral arms, uh, they're full of very big, very massive young stars, uh, very blue and, and uh, formed in probably in the last giga year. So there does seem to be a, a, a striking difference in their ability to form stars today, uh, certainly for the, the galaxies in the local neighbourhood. But how does dark matter come into the actual formation of the galaxies? Well, this is, uh, since we can't see dark matter, uh, this is the problem. We, we, uh, we have, in the last sort of 20 years, turned to large simulations. So what people do is they take a big computer, they put in uh, sort of dark matter into the computer and let that evolve and see what would happen. And what, what you see in these simulations is that uh, galaxies build up through the, uh, the merging of other little galaxies. So you start with lots of little things and slowly but surely you end up with a big galaxy through the merger of dark matter. Halo. Does that apply to our Milky Way galaxy too? Yeah, so the, the implication would be is most massive galaxies in the local universe have built up through the building up through lots of little galaxies. So sort of a, we call it hierarchical uh, evolution that you build big galaxies through little galaxies. How does your recent research throw new light on this, Jerry? What we thought we were studying when we started looking at these little dwarf galaxies were the fossil leftover building blocks, the few bits and pieces that hadn't yet finished merging into the Milky Way. 
and we expected that that's what we would find. It turns out that they're a bit different than that because the stars in these little dwarf galaxies are actually not the same as the stars in the Milky Way. But nonetheless, what we are seeing is galaxies merging inside other into a bigger galaxy. We're actually watching stuff merging into our Milky Way and so we are seeing the equivalent of the computer simulation except we're just seeing it as it's done by nature uh, spread out <coughs> um, instead of a few milliseconds we see it spread out over a few billion years and what we've most recently discovered which is the direct evidence for all this process is a galaxy the Sagittarius galaxy merging with the Milky Way and we've recently discovered two complete circles of its tail left behind it so we're watching this sort of comet like tail wrap around the sky and that process is actually our Milky Way gobbling up Sagittarius. We're having lunch and it's precisely the process Bob was talking about and we're watching it happen. So we know that this process happens. The debate is about when it happened and, and how fast it happened early in the universe but it sure as heck is still happening today. Is we're this watching. dwarf Sagittarius galaxy actually in our Milky Way galaxy now? Yeah, it's, it's actually inside our Milky Way and it's in its death throes and we've found more recently even little more than, than the Cheshire Cat smile, just the tail the trail that's left across the sky from something else that we ate where the, the parent has gone. We, we obvious, for obvious reasons, we call that the orphan stream. And it's just a streak of stars left behind with, with its parent completely gobbled up. What do you think are the next major steps in this research? Well, I think uh, from galaxy evolution standpoint, when we're trying to work out what are the mechanisms that are changing a galaxy or making it evolve, uh, I think there are sort of two things that we need to do. One we need lots more galaxies. Uh, <laughs> there's never enough, right? There, there are millions and millions of galaxies out there and we want to study them to get, just get better statistics. A bit like sort of studying people, right? If you're trying to understand why I have ginger hair, uh, go and look at millions of ginger-haired people and see where they live. It's the same sort of analogy. Um, so that's one thing. We want more, of, more galaxies to look at. And then I think we also sort of want to use different uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So right now we've been talking mostly about optical light that our you know, telescopes on the ground can look at. But there's some fantastic new satellites coming up that can look at infrared, look at the ultraviolet. Uh, so we can look at sort of everything from the radio all the way through to X-ray and sort of look at uh, a panchromatic view of galaxies. And I think that'll tell us about the real key processes that are evolving, uh, making these galaxies evolve. Jerry? The challenge there is actually to find the smallest galaxy. We've already gone down by a factor of about 50 in the last two years with what we found. So the, the most recent galaxy we found is 50 times smaller than, than the previous known one from just two years ago. And some, somewhere down there is the smallest object that can form that is a galaxy. <clears throat> and once we know that, we know the basic building block. And so our challenge is actually to find the smallest thing. It's not big as good in that case. It's, uh, it's, it's small as interesting. And finally, may I ask you both a direct question? Do you know what dark matter is? Well, um, I was afraid you were going to ask me that question. Um, no. Uh, not at all. No. Well, um, <laughs> that says it all. <laughs> You're not allowed to use that. You know? <laughs> Jerry, Bob, thank you very much. When I come back next month, we're going to talk about the biggest bangs in the universe. So until then, good night. Tomorrow, don't miss the last Planet Earth at 7. Tonight, living with disability on a remote island in one of the poorest countries in the world, board the floating orthopaedic clinic that gives people back their mobility and independence. Next.